dear fellow children of God, given the bread of eternal life. You know, the Lord has blessed our nation with such an abundance of food that we have a problem. Such a problem that there's a nonprofit group on the internet called the Campaign to End Obesity. And it claims that the effects of our nation's obesity epidemic are immense. Taxpayers, businesses, uh, communities, and individuals spend hundreds of billions of dollars each year due to obesity, including nearly $200 billion in medical costs. Much can be done to reverse this epidemic. Changes can enable more Americans to eat healthy and be active, as well as those that provide appropriate medical treatment for patients' care can be made. As Jesus walked this earth, the people of his land did not need such a campaign. It took hard physical labor to get the food they needed. So after Jesus fed them without any labor on their part, they decided to make him their king so that he could feed them every day so they no longer would have to work to get their food. They were wrong, of course. So Jesus called them to repent, to change their priorities. He declared, he is the bread of, that gives eternal life. You know, it takes a lot of work to make a loaf of bread. A field must be plowed, seed must be sown. Then God in his grace must give the right amount of sunshine and rain. After it's fully mature, then we must harvest it. We must transport it to a mill where the mill will be grinded into flour. Once the flour is made, it must be sent off to a bakery where they'll add yeast, they'll knead it, they'll let it rise, they'll bake it, and then they will put it in a plastic bag and ship it to the store. You know, we often give little thought about how much work is required to make a loaf of bread. Most of us, when we want a, a loaf of bread, we go to the store and we, we buy it. Easy, right? Well, wrong. Added to all that's needed to make the bread, we need a figurative bread. This guy, money. Most of us have to labor to work or work hard to get this. And if we don't, we worked our whole life to get the, to where we're at. And that's why uh, many desire to get as much bread like this with as little work as possible. That's why the Jews there that day wanted to force Jesus to make, it, give, make them be, king, be their king and make them free bread. See, however, God didn't send Jesus, his son, into the world to do that. He sent them to redeem them from sin, from death, and from hell, to give them eternal life. So Jesus called them to repent. In, in earlier here, he told them, don't seek the bread, the food that spoils, but seek the bread, the food that he would give them, that would give them eternal life. And then Jesus spoke figuratively to them, saying, if anyone eats this bread, if you believe in me as the Savior sent by God, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which will I, give for, which I will give for the life of the world. I will offer up my life to pay for the sins of the world. The Jews, however, took Jesus literally and began to argue among themselves. Well, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And some said, well, you know, it would be a sin to eat Jesus' flesh. It's cannibalism. And others said, even if it wasn't a sin, there's not enough of Jesus to feed everybody there in his body. And still others, you know, got the metaphor. And they said, no way am I going to repent. No way am I going to trust in Jesus for eternal life. And you see, the Jews argued for, for two reasons. One, they were blinded by the fact that they had as their number one priority food for this world. And two, they simply didn't want to repent. They thought they didn't need to repent. How could these Jews be like this? They had God's word. 
How could they make bread for this world their number one priority? How could they refuse to repent when Jesus told them they were wrong? Well, to answer those questions, let's imagine an absurdity. What absurdity? A congregation, instead of taking an offering, gives $10,000 to each person who attends weekly worship. How many do you think would attend? Now imagine another absurdity. Some begin to miss worship regularly. And when they're asked why did they miss worship, they reply, well, you know, it's held at the wrong, at the wrong day for me. And, oh, it's the wrong time. Or, you know, I was tired. I, got it. I, was, I was out late last night. And then, what about Monday? Well, uh, I had something else to do then. I have other things I wanted to do. And then they, they might go on and say, you know, I wanted to go to this game. Or I, I wanted to, to go golfing. Or I wanted to go hunting and fishing. Uh, I wanted to run a marathon. I wanted to go camping. I wanted to ride horses. You know, something they wanted to do. Still others say, you know, I needed more than that $10,000. So I decided to work when you held worship. Now here's even more absurd. In addition to these excuses, each one of them adds this. You know, I shouldn't have to attend worship to get the $10,000. You should send it to me. Now hear what God's word says about worship. In the Old Testament, God set aside the seventh day for rest and for a sacred day of assembly to the Lord, a day of worship. In the New Testament, God said, choose whatever day you want to worship, but gather together to worship as Christians. Do this to be filled with the Spirit, to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. And you see, God gave that command because he chose worship as a way to give his people a gift worth far more than $10,000. Far more than all the gold and silver and all the wealth this world has to offer. He chose to give the bread that gives eternal life, his son Jesus, at worship through the word and the sacrament. Some, however, reject this command of God. Some say, well, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe, however, that I'm saved by grace through faith alone. Therefore, I have no need to attend worship. I'm not saved by going to church. Besides, I have other things to do that are higher on my priority list, you know, that are more important to me than worship. I know, you know. And such statements like that, they tell you exactly how the Jews could make getting the things of this world their number one priority. <coughs> to both, you know, you know, now some might respond to this by, by thinking, you might be thinking out there, you know, I get it, Pastor, I get it. Now get off this worship bandwagon thing. You're making me feel guilty. I'm here today. And others, you know, might respond, you go, Pastor, you keep, you keep on it. You give it to those people who don't attend church. You know, to both. God says, change, repent, change your way of thinking, because you're missing the point here. The point is, what is your number one priority in life? That's what Jesus is telling them. You know, worship attendance is a picture of a person's priority of their relationship to Jesus. You know, it's a way for you to see where you put Jesus on your list of things to do. So where do you put Jesus? Do you believe it's okay to skip worship simply because you don't want to go? And or you have some other fun thing that you want to do? during the time your church gathers to worship? 
to worship Jesus? Hmm. In your home, do you, do you listen to what the TV says, the computer says, and, and the radio experts all say, this is the right food you ought to eat, and this is uh, for you and your family to eat, and here's some good at physical activities for you to do, and do you listen to that and then strive to do those? And then do you spend time taking your children to all these physical activities that train their bodies? But if told, and don't, then if you're told that your children and you should eat Jesus, that is, have family devotions, read from the Bible in your home, pray together, and worship at your church regularly, do you reply, we do that? Or do you reply, we try to do that? Or do you reply, really? We don't have time for that. It's hard enough to get to worship regularly. Pastor, you just ask too much of us. If given a chance to worship on Sunday morning and maybe attend a class on how you can keep and make more money, would you attend both? Or would you say, well, the important one is in the evening. That's the one I'm going to. So what does your worship priorities, your worship life, tell you about your priorities, your relationship to Jesus? Are you like those Jews who, with, with Jesus that day who put earthly bread first and just refused to repent? You know, we all must admit that at times we put this earthly bread in front of Jesus. And uh, when we're told to not do it, we say, I'm, I'm doing it my way. We refuse to repent. Yet God, in his amazing grace, doesn't just throw up his hands and say, send them all to hell. No, God, in his in his grace continues to call us to repent, to admit that we have sinned, and to eat the bread Jesus offers us. The amazing grace that moved Jesus to say to those Jews, I tell you the truth, there is no disputing this, that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, unless you believe that I'm the Savior sent by God, you have no life in me. You're spiritually dead. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, whoever trusts in me as the Savior has eternal life. Your body may die and be buried, but I'll take your soul to heaven to live with God until I raise him up at the last day, until I reunite your body and soul, and you live forever with God in a world without sorrow, without sickness, without pain, without death. For my flesh is real flesh food. And my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. And with these statements, Jesus is comparing physical life to spiritual life. We need to feed our bodies properly so that they can go on living. We need physical activities. To, to, so they can live. If we don't eat or drink, if we don't do these things, our physical life will end. And the same is true for our souls, our spiritual life. If we eat Jesus, if we hear God's word, if we come and come to faith in him, but if we say, I came to faith in him, now that's enough. I heard God's word once, and that's all I need. I don't need any more of Jesus. Our souls will die. So we need to continue to hear God's word, to remain spiritually alive until God calls us to heaven. Now at this, you might, might, might ask a pastor, how, how did we go, how did you go from eating and drinking Jesus to hearing God's word? The very first chapter of the Gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. 
13 verses later, it continues, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from God the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the, God's one and only son, the Savior is the word made flesh. And in order to eat and drink Jesus, we need to hear God's word, we need to hear the Bible. If a person doesn't hear God's word, he separates himself from Jesus, and his soul will die. You know, if a person comes to worship and doesn't listen to God's word, if he lets it go in one ear and out the other, if they forget God's word as soon as they walk out the door, his or her faith will be weak, it will be underfed, it may even die, because that person has their priorities all wrong. Our text concludes with Jesus pointing to himself and saying, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna, an earthly bread God gave to the children of Israel to sustain their bodies as they traveled to the promised land. And they died. Even though the manna was directly from God, a miracle by God, they still died. It didn't give eternal life. It's like this bread we buy in the market. It's like all the food we eat. It's not going to keep you from dying. Unless Jesus comes again, no matter how carefully we watch what we eat, what type of bread we eat, all these different things, no matter how often we exercise, if those are the only bread we take in, we don't only take in this, and we only seek this, We will die eternally. But he who feeds on this bread, on Jesus, will live forever. Jesus, the word made flesh, gave this promise. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. You know, the entire Bible teaches sinners to eat and drink Jesus. You know, our Old Testament reading this morning invites you to do that when it says, come, eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of understanding. Our epistle reading invites you to do that when it says, be very careful then how you live. The days are evil. Live not as the unwise but as the wise, making use of every opportunity to worship, to feed your soul, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understand, it's not the Lord's will for you to trust in this bread, what this bread symbolizes. It's not the Lord's will for you to trust in this. They can't give you eternal life. The Lord's will is that you eat and drink Jesus. You hear his word every day. You hear his call to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. To believe in the Lord Jesus. And you'll be saved, you and your household, you and your family. Believe that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Christ death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus is the bread that gives eternal life. Amen.